motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to episode 88 of the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. And the title for this week's episode is Ties. And my special guest today is Kristin Sweeting Morelli. Now, Kristin's an entrepreneur and expert in the fields of energy and transformation, as well as being an advocate for all women. She formerly co-hosted the Everything is Energy podcast, a podcast that was number three in the US behind Oprah and Marianne Williamson. That's a big one, isn't it? I mean, seriously. Today, she's the founder and leader of Red Sisterhood, a deep dive transformational container for women to learn how to embody the power of our femininity. Red stands for Radiant Erotic Divine. And Kristen teaches us to become more red in our lives in loving, safe and intimate environments where it's safe to be authentically ourselves. I am super looking forward to sharing my conversation with Kristen with you. Now it's a biggie because we discuss huge questions starting out with when's it a good time to cut ties and how do we cut ties in a way that creates peace rather than chaos? Now Kristen takes us deep into the process of when she cut ties with her family of origin and it's a moving story. We also talk narcissism, one of the scariest episodes of Kristen's life and how she's reclaiming herself and her power. I'm not going to keep you waiting any longer, listeners. Let's dive into my conversation with Kristen on ties. Kristen, welcome to the School for Mothers podcast. I am so looking forward to speaking about ties. Wonderful. I'm thrilled, beyond thrilled to be here. Well, you know, I've just I've just introduced you with a walloping bio. So, I mean, you know, there's so much to you. I'm wondering where to start, to be honest, with ties, because yeah. it's an unusual, you know, it's an unusual title. I think I'm going to share with the listeners, our, our wonderful listeners, why I had this, I was reading Facebook, I think it was some like three o'clock in the morning, um, British time. Yeah. And so it was, you know, different time zone um, in the States. And I saw this really um, heartfelt post that you put on Facebook and um, followed my gut, which said, write to Kristen, write to her and say, oh my God, I want you to come and talk to me about cutting ties. Yeah. And I don't want to spoil with what it was about, but it's like, yeah, I think the whole subject about cutting ties as opposed to wearing them, which is terribly boring. (laughs) (laughs) I just like, you know, it's quite fascinating because lots of us cut ties with people, don't we? We do. And, And, you know, there's a way I think to do it. There's, there's different things. There's some people who are going to be listening who haven't cut ties who need to. Mm. And then there are going to be some people who are listening who have cut ties with people, but perhaps haven't done some of the healing work for themselves or even interpersonally because there's, you know, I don't know if this is true in the UK, but in the U S there's, there's this thing that's quite popular to basically ghost people. And I don't mean just in dating, I mean in life. And both of those extremes I find are not the healthiest way forward. There are healthier ways to um, cut ties. And for me, coming from the kind of family that I came from, it was so important for me to actually cut ties with them. It was very scary, but it was one of the most important things I've done in my life. Um, But the way that I did it, I'm really grateful for as well, because it helped me to move further into myself and to really become the woman that I wanted to become and I needed to become without having the burden of my past dragging on me. I mean, that's a beautiful way of putting it, isn't it? That, you know, you're 
choice as to what, what and whom you brought with you. And I'm curious how you did that compared with those other two options that you were talking about of kind of doing the cut, not doing the work and ghosting. So what was the difference for you, Kristen, in, in how you did it? Yeah, um, I'm sitting here thinking about it. I think I have, so I, my background, I've, I've experienced a lot of trauma in my life and have had to learn how to build a life in, even though I had a really traumatized, tra- traumatic childhood. And so part of that traumatic childhood was a lot of abandonment. So I think for me, I was quite reluctant to abandon others. So I didn't tend to go to the side of like the sort of ghosting, you know, not talking to someone anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the first times that I did it was with my family of origin when I was 39 years old. And it took me a long time to do it, to be quite honest. You know, even though I'd grown up with quite a bit of negligence and abuse, and honestly, the negligence was more harmful than the abuse. I, like so many, had a bit of Stockholm Syndrome, you know, in the sense that my abusers, um, I protected them and and cared about them and was incredibly loyal. And the reason that I even chose to cut ties, I knew I wanted it in my body, but I had this beautiful mentor at the time. And, you know, he's one of the, considered one of sort of the grandfathers of the personal development movement. And he was just his personal mentor to me. He just did it for free because he saw such promise in in me and what I was doing. And um, he helped me through it. So I was 39 and he said, you know, your 40s, your... And and, and by the way, I also had a son who was probably about 10 at the time, nine, something like that. Hmm. And he said, you know, if you didn't properly individuate at various stages in your life. And he talked about some of the stages, you know, one being teenage years, right? Teenagers can be so difficult because they're individuating. And then also at a point in the twenties, he said, it seems that the next opportunity really comes in the forties. And I was about, you know, going to be 40 um, in another year. And I'd been saying, I really want, I, I started to accept the truth of the family that I'd been born into. And I don't know if this will resonate with anyone, but I think we walk around telling stories and lies, not purposely, yeah. not because we're liars, but we tell stories about our own childhood. Some of us tell stories that maybe it was worse than it was. Some, t- some of us tell stories that we don't actually acknowledge and face the truth of how painful the relationship was. And, and honestly, I think people do this in marriages and into all kinds of relationships. And I think I was at the stage of telling the truth. Like I looked the truth in the eye and I realized that if I didn't cut ties in those relationships, I wasn't going to be standing for myself. Like the truth was dark and it was not redeemable. And I think that's one of the differences. You know, there's a lot that we can do to maybe move relationships further away from us with really amazing communication. But that was a particular situation that the boundary needed to be. We're not going to have contact because their commitment to to lying about our family structure and what happened was so significant that it was causing me to not feel very connected to myself. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's how I arrived at that decision. It was, it was a really, it was a monumental decision actually for me in my life to be willing to tell the truth about my childhood. And once I tell the truth to say, the truth is I don't have a bond with these people and I've been pretending to have one. Um, my situation is more extreme than probably most of your listeners, but you know, I, I really don't have a bond here. And so we need to have this relationship not exist in the same form anymore. Well, it's very difficult to develop impeccability, integrity, honesty with ourselves and and other things with ourselves if we are also upholding a level of sham elsewhere or denial or 
surely uh, you know it's particularly with our family of origin yes I agree with you. Yeah, that's so well put too. And I wish someone had just said that to me, you know, but I think it's all this thing around unpacking the lies, mm. you know, and so what you read on Facebook, you know, I, I kept my family secrets for decades. And the first time that I outed my stepfather was during Me Too. Yeah. And then the only other time you've seen me talk, that I've spoken about it was what you read. And after writing that, I made a decision that every Thursday I'm going to share another secret because secrets are lies. And that's where shame lives. Shame lives in all that secrecy, right? Mm. And so when we're keeping those secrets, even unconsciously, we don't realize that we're keeping secrets. Like I would not have considered myself a secret keeper. I would have considered myself a truth teller. But that wasn't true. I was keeping secrets because I was sh ashamed mm -hmm. of the way that I was treated. And I thought that if I told anyone the way that I was treated, I would have that stain on me. But the truth was I was carrying around that shame and you could smell it if you got within, you know, six feet of me energetically. And so it's important to start telling yourself the truth. So thank you for saying that. Because I agree. Mm. Yeah, because it does, it does soil, it, it, it leaks, doesn't it? It's, it's something yes. that as, as amazing as we, we may be when we've done other pieces of work and I'm talking about therapeutic work and, and, you know, nevertheless, unless those secrets and lies are given air to bring them out from the dark into the light, then yes. how can we stand fully in the center and say, I am me, I am lovable, I am enough, I am who I am. You know, it's, yeah. it's like there's a, there's a, there are parts that are hidden and yeah, that shame is, is, yeah, it just, it just means that we can't be fully seen because, because we can't yes. and therefore loved. And, and so telling those mm -hmm. truths, those secrets and those lies, Oh gosh, I mean, you gave yourself life. It, it sounds like it was a choice between death of death, of, a, a slow, torturous death and life. Yeah, it was one of the most important things I've done. And I find it really hard to explain to people, but it, it was, I began to, you said it, I began to love myself for real. No woo woo spiritual you know, personal development mantras and blah, blah, blah. Like I really, that was the first time I took a stand for myself. Mm. Sorry. It was the second time. The first time was another situation, but it was the second time in my life that I really took a stand for myself and I did it harmoniously. I wasn't, you know, there weren't all these, you know, terrible words expressed back and forth. Although I think there's room for that too. I think um, in American culture, and I believe this is true in British culture as well, there, and I come from, so my family's British, right? So things aren't talked about and everything sort of gets stuck, stuffed under the rug. And I don't know if it's still like that, but, but in those cultures, there's not, it's like the emotion of anger isn't acceptable. And so my first wave with my family of origin was very peaceful and like, this is what I need to do. This is what feels right to me. And then they continued to attempt to harm me. And then the wave that you saw was like a ferocious, mm. you know, anger that came out to protect my space. But I used to not even be able to be angry because if you don't stand for yourself, right, you might have like, be able to have like a fit of anger, but I couldn't sit in anger and hold a boundary because I, I didn't know how to do that as a child. So that first time of actually cutting ties led to deeper self-love, more self-advocating, more awareness of my body, more ability to negotiate my needs and relationships, which became, you know, paramount in my work. That, that being able to, to know what my needs were and to negotiate for those in relationship, you know, ended up becoming probably the most important development in all the work that I've done, maybe that and energy work, but, but it all started by standing for myself. Do you see what I'm saying? Like oh, the ability, yeah. the ability and willingness to move something away that isn't quite right for you. 
And so as you talk about standing for yourself, you were to mention the you your son. And so how yeah. how is how have your choices to, or your f- that fundamental cutting ties with your family of origin? How has that affected him? And you know, how yeah. Does, yeah, I mean, because because yeah. sometimes we sometimes as mothers we we stop short of doing that stand because of oh I've heard it from friends by the way it's like you know I, oh, but what about the children they need they deserve that relationship well I have yeah. answers for that but you know that kind of all of that how how has that been for you yeah so one of the things that i'm really proud of with my son is that i have the ability to hold both as true so yeah. for example even though i was choosing not to be in a relationship he and i talked about it and i made sure that he had all the connections that he could see them that they could see him that was a really important element for me, he, as he got older, just knew a little bit about, and still only knows a little bit about the kind of abuse and neglect that I lived with as a child and even as an adult. But, you know, he, so he's been free to have his relationships with them and I've facilitated them seeing each other. But as he's gotten older, you know, my son's 19 Mm -hmm. and as he's gotten older, he's come into himself about it. So let me pause here. Now I did have boundaries. So if they did any shenanigans that I felt were unhealthy, I would have and did step in to hold the boundary. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because it, it's, yeah. it's the so obvious they, thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if they did anything... Like if they had even said one word about me that was not positive to my son, that would have been it. They would not have had access to my son because I wouldn't have placed him in that situation where there's people who he's close to who are causing him to think less of or mistreat his own mother, right? That was a non-starter for me. They didn't do that. And there was, you know, one time when my biological mother tried to you know, play some games with my son. And I, and I very um, kindly, but firmly put my foot down. And I said, if, if you do that again, he's not going to come see you. Like that's going to be the way that you don't, don't get the opportunity to see him. Yeah. So, so long as we can play on the same page and everybody can treat each other with kindness and respect, I'm absolutely fine. That was sort of my boundary. But what's interesting is I have a 19 year old son who behaves much like a 40 year old man in terms of his understanding of boundaries and standing for himself. And that's been fascinating to watch. Mm. And he didn't always. So I think what happens, you know, so we think that things happen in a vacuum and they don't. Like, I'm sure you know this as a mom, like the things that you haven't addressed in the other parts of your life are going to impact your parenting. So no different than me not having boundaries with my family, guess who I also didn't have boundaries with. Yeah, of course. (laughs) Right? So he and I had to you know, over the last seven or eight years, renegotiate the entire relationship, which wasn't easy. And I took responsibility for it. I was like, listen, you know, I didn't teach you what my boundaries were. So of course you run roughshod over me, but I am going to take them back. Mm. And we did it bit by bit. And as I did that, he developed his, he went from not having good boundaries to developing a strong sense of himself. And he shows it over and over in work, in school, in relationships. I'm, I'm beyond, he's so far beyond where I was at 19. It's one of those things that actually I'm going to backtrack, which is I love how you really are so ex- explicit about being incredibly proud about this and your son, because it is a huge renegotiation, isn't it? If, when, you, when, we, when we realize that actually we haven't held boundaries for ourselves, well, how could we yeah. if we had a childhood that didn't you know, that, that merged or we, we didn't have, we didn't learn about boundaries, then of course yeah. you would reproduce that. But to actually then renegotiate is amazing and, you know, an almighty journey. It was hard. I was wondering about how come, because it's one of the, one of the things that I am curious about really in life is how come women particularly often have boundary issues? I have a theory about this. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I teach women almost exclusively, right? Mm-hmm. And I think there's a few things that don't get considered. This all bothers me, you know, when there's people out there, you know, teaching to women or advertising to them or whatever. There's a few things about women. So first of all, most women, and I'm going to say this as a broad brushstroke, this doesn't include certain people where they're not wired this way, but most women have estrogen soaked brains. The survival part of the female brain, there's, there's other people who are more experts than I am on this, but I've read their books and, and have found it to be true in my work and with myself. The, that the survival part of our brain that isn't really processing sort of what's here and now, right? It's the survival stuff. The survival stuff, stuff part of our brain has us want to be agreeable, even the strong willed or the ones who seem really strong among, among us, it has us want to be agreeable. Hmm. What a vile right? word. <laughs> well, I know, but, that, but, but if we're friendly to it, then we can work with it, right? Yes, if we say, because yeah. I think we beat ourselves up. Like, why are we so people pleasing? Why are we so agreeable? Actually, y- your biology and your hormones are all set up for you to be agreeable. And if a woman can realize that, then they start to like, I think, make a lot of progress. So if you know, like, hey, we came into this world for the most part, feeling that if we get kicked out of the cave, you know, again, this is like 50,000 years ago where the brain hasn't evolved. But, but this survival part thinks if you get kicked out of the cave, you'll die. Well, the way to stay in the cave is to be agreeable. So that's one piece. Then Mm -hmm. your estrogen soaked body and brain connection is more important than separation at the most fundamental level. And actually you'll notice watch women who go through menopause. They do not care near or even perimenopause into their forties do not care nearly as much about people pleasing as teen girls, girl, women in their twenties, women in their 30s, and it starts to decrease. And my theory is because estrogen is actually decreasing. And as estrogen decreases, you meet women in, you know, their 50s, like, I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. But is it, I mean, clearly at a biological level or hormonal hormonal level, you're completely right. Obviously, those those are decreasing. Is it also that, that women... You know, they, we've gone through the cycle of listening to to the media fantasy of what women's lives need, girls' lives need to look like, and actually, many of us find that that's kind of we've been sold a dud. We've been oh, it's sold such a lies. Dud. It's such you know, a dud. <laughs> yeah, that we need yeah. to meet somebody that will complete us. I mean, how yeah. vomit worthy is that? That we are not whole and complete as we are. That there is, you know, that there's other person, and generally, it's 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 a man. You know, <laughs> we're yeah. sold that it'll be a man that will come yeah. and rescue and love us and supply things for us and protect us and and be sweep us and still this is an insistent narrative that has young you know young girls i have teenage girls that that you know is still pervasive everywhere <laughs> i mean so, everywhere can, okay can i say i want to say something about this i agree with you I, that's what i was saying about the advertisers right so to mm. me movies and things like that they're type of advertising right they're selling a story mm, of course. um yes i agree with all of that and Biologically and hormonally, women do have, this is where I've evolved to in the last probably seven or eight years, we have a desire to be protected. Mm. We do have a desire to be provided for. Because what I find actually is that we don't have the hormonal baseline. We don't have the testosterone. We literally don't. We have a, a 30th. If you think about that in real numbers, it's gigantic a 15th to a 30th of the testosterone that most male bodied people have. Now that's changing because at least in the U S there's too many hormones that are in our food and in our water. And 
in xenoestrogens that are in our cleaning products and all of that, right? So it's changing so that men, mm. their testosterone levels are dropping. But if you, if you get a man back to his, t- you know, baseline testosterone, testosterone in itself provides the need, the desire to protect and, and to provide for, and actually to penetrate, to, to have sex. Just to, I'm just talking about hormones here, right? So testosterone has that um, and it also provides focus, single focus, the ability to drive towards a goal. And then you have, this is again, just my theory. Then you have, you know, the feminist era of the last 60 or 70 years, and I'm so grateful for it and have always considered myself a feminist, but I think it's more nuanced for me now. But then you have the feminist movement that tells us, hey, girls, your value is not in what you look like. It's in what you accomplish, what you get done. But most women that I meet, by the time they're in their 40s, and now it's starting to actually be women in their 20s and 30s, but by the time they're in their 40s, they're exhausted. They're completely burnt out. And I believe, and their hormones are jacked. They're just, their hormones are completely jacked up. Because instead of having baseline testosterone for us to accomplish results and get things done, we're borrowing a stress hormone called cortisol. And that causes the other hormones to not properly produce in the body. And so it just creates this whole nightmare by the time women are in their 40s. And what I would love to see in the feminist movement is, hey, listen, yes, go out there, kick ass, accomplish all of this have really successful businesses. I mean, I've had seven, five, seven figure brands. I've built those. I retired when I was 28. Like I've had a lot. This is how I came to this because this was my life, right? I'd always been accomplishing. And for some reason I was at 35, 36. I was really unhappy. And I couldn't figure out why I was so like baseline unhappy. And it happened to be that I was overriding the needs of the feminine part of me because I wanted to fit in with what I was being told, you know, on the other side by the feminist movement that my value was in what I do and what I would love. I would love to rewrite this whole thing. And you have teenage girls. Like I would love for them to know that, yeah, if they want to go out and kick ass, yes, absolutely. In order to make that sustainable, they need to understand how to go back to the well of their femininity. And if they know how to do that, it will be sustainable. And it will be enjoyable. And yes, let a man or a woman, depending on what kind of relationships or or multiple men or however you want to define it, however you want, provide for you and protect you if that's what you desire. While also staying grounded in your own womb, in your own center of power as a woman without giving your power away. And in there is where a woman gets to have it all, truly have it all. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, it's powerful, isn't it? Because when we, when you look at the, the reclamation of the feminine and the, the yes. receiving, so receiving as opposed to out there penetrating, whether it's accomplishing in the workplace and you know, I'm reminded of the fact that, you know, it's not any, it's at no big surprise that women's hormones are are, are all over the show. I mean, so many women are kind of, you know, uh, stunting, stopping, halting their hormones or changing them with the pill, you know, with the contraceptive pill. And therefore, you know, it's their bodies, their bodies have, our bodies have gone on a thoroughly different journey than, you know, really we were built for. So there's so many pieces to this that are, I mean, crucial for us to engage with. When we look at how do we live our lives? Who do we, who do we maintain ties with? What kinds of relationships do we want for ourselves Mm. as women, as empowered, strong, tender, fragile, you know, Fragile in the sense of strength, vulnerable, in touch with our hearts. Yeah. Who do we want to be? What kind of mothers do we want to be if we want to be a mother? You know, it's not the panacea to everything. Um, and I see that in my own daughters of watching a highly accomplished mother and also, you know, one who, who works 
closely with women around their feminine power too. And yeah. and what does that look like? Who? How do you embody yeah. that? There's no one way, is there? There's no. There's so many ways to be. And and I I think it's it's brilliant, brilliant work. And you know, I really I've got this call to for you to tell us what has been happening in the last few years because you've been moving, haven't you? From yeah, as you said, you know, m- massive success. We still hugely successful, and and things have you know you've had this oscillation, haven't you? In 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 your life in the last few years, yeah. where have you been, Kristen? Yeah, so you know it's interesting if you look at. I teach a lot about personal responsibility, and personal responsibility mm. is not self blame because that's quite misunderstood. Totally different, yeah. Right, um, but I teach a lot about personal responsibility. And I went through, I had a a traumatic childhood, but I didn't know that I did. You know, by the time I was 23, I had met my son's father. So, you know, um, only out of college for a couple of years. And of course, I would go and recreate the trauma of my childhood Mm -hmm. because I didn't have consciousness around it and it felt familiar and exciting. And I, got pregnant with my son, had my son, and then I had a premonition. I woke up in the early hours of the morning and I knew that if I stayed in this relationship, I would be really, really unhappy in my life. Hmm. And I still loved him, but I just knew it. And so uh, we were in, I guess maybe this is the first time I stood for myself. I forgot about this one. We were in couples therapy and I went into the therapist and I said, I just had this realization and all the things we've been arguing about, they don't matter to me anymore. He just needs to be not so controlling of me and emotionally available. Stayed in the relationship for about a year and he just didn't show up and so finally decided to end it. And everything was okay. I wouldn't say it was an amazing co-parenting situation, but it wasn't horrible, you know, sort of middle of the road. And then, but the one thing that always struck me about him is the need to compete and the need to control, just the need to control everything. And for someone who doesn't have good boundaries, you know, oftentimes we're a good fit for someone who needs to control. So fast forward, maybe seven or eight years, I get, I start a new relationship. I start, you know, I come up, um, I'd been retired and I come out of retirement, start my first business. It's a seven figure business within a couple of months. We start a podcast. It's number three on iTunes behind Oprah Winfrey and Marianne Williamson, like really successful, right? And he starts coming after me. And this man that I had met was really close with my son. So he starts coming after me starts taking me to court constantly. And every time he does, he loses really badly. Thankfully, I'm so grateful. Um, But every time he would take me to court about stuff for my son, he would just lose really, really badly. It would just be a wallop. And um, he did it again, you know, so he did it in 2009, then he did it again in 2011, and then he did it again in 2014. And each time, you know, the way I would describe it, it was like, he was a bit like Voldemort, like, you know, he would almost be stamped out and then he would mutate and learn and come back stronger. (laughs) He would. And so the final time he accused me, well, in, in, in the court cases, because it was so traumatizing and I would protect my mental health, I oftentimes wouldn't read the pleadings and things, you know, I would just ask my lawyers, like, what do you need me to answer? And I'm happy to answer it. So what I didn't know is there were these pictures and these pleadings of my home And then in 2014, he then accused me, basically, I don't know if you all have it in the UK, but here, apparently there's something where if a child's in significant danger, the court will remove the child from the home and then ask questions later. Yeah, we have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he filed that on my birthday in 2014, December, 2014. And I mean, I was horrified, but now I was angry in ways that I had never been. And so I demanded that the court make him pay my attorney's fees because it was outlandish, right? Mm -hmm. And in the response, there were more photos, but I didn't read the response. So fast forward another month. Now we're in early 2015 and I've started 
because this coincides, I want to explain this to you. The reason I brought up success is because it has to do with this. So I had started leading women and it was spectacularly, wildly successful. We were doing the Red Tent Revival and women were just coming in droves, right? Tens of thousands of women were coming from all over the world. And so at the, every time I would go and come out of retirement was when, or, or my business would really grow in some significant way, I would manifest outside of me a villain, someone to attack me. And it happened to be him. And, and when we do these things, from my perspective, this is just a, you know, it sounds like you're very, you have a lot of mastery around all of this. So none of this probably surprises you, right? That we will go and take all those core childhood beliefs that we've never healed and we go and we expand in the world and then whoops, they show up again. Yeah. It's such a shame, isn't it? It's it is, a bugger. We think we've oh, got them sorted. Damn it. It's, just, it's a horrible. <laughs> so anyway, so yes. 2015 happens and my, you know, it's January, my lawyer calls me and she says, I need you to come to my office. I had two lawyers. They said, we need you to come to our office. We need to talk to you. You're not facing something and you need to face it. And they sit me down. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget what I was eating. I'll never forget the office, every detail. And they said, we think that your home is being broken into. And we think that your property is being trespassed on and that you're under Mm -hmm. surveillance. And um, I remember they gave it to me and I said, you know, I, I remember thinking they are so histrionic. Like, could they be more hysterical? I'm not being... I'm not under surveillance. That's ridiculous. So I call a lawyer friend. He comes over. I'm like, can you tell me like these pictures, they look like they're my home, but I have all glass windows. I live on a trail. Like I'm sure someone took them from the trail and my lawyer walks around for a while. My friend walks around and he's like, no, these were taken inside your home. So then I go to my son and I say, sweetheart, you know, I just need to know, do you know of anyone who's come into our home? Cause I'm still not even willing to consider them. This is how, you know, this is how this works when you're not willing to face the truth of the trauma that you've been, a, been mm. victimized by, right? And, and I, I use that word in a particular way. Anyway, they call me about a, a, a month later and they're like, we need you to hire a forensic you know, photographer. He comes out, take, you know, looks everywhere and he says, yes, let me tell you all the times your house has been um, broken into or your, your property has been trespassed on. Like he tells me exactly where people have been standing. He even shows me a reflection of their hands in the glass, and which was super creepy. And uh, then, yeah, and oh, yeah, violating. So, so, so he tells me that that day, that night, my lawyers call me screaming, screaming, and my brand is not, you know, taking off. My business is taking off, and and personal life is beautiful and fun and wonderful. They call me screaming and I'm like, seriously, calm down. Like, what is wrong? And they're like, grab your son's iPad, get his iPad, get his iPad. You're under surveillance. They've, they're monitoring you through his iPad. And I can remember dropping the phone. Like it finally realized what was going on. And I dropped the phone and I started screaming and they had broken into my email account of, I've never shared this actually publicly. Um, they broke into my email account of the last seven years. It had 27,000 emails in it. Every legal, every personal, every psychological, every medical, every financial, every relationship, everything was in that email account. And they'd been mm. uh, digging through it for months. People who met me harm were digging through the most intimate, vulnerable details of my life. and were using it to traumatize me. And that became the, that was the beginning, you know, everything fell apart. You know, I went from, you know, usually we would do like the red tent revival. We'd do, you know, more than $500,000 launch. And I think we did like 20,000 because I tried to do it while I was going through this trauma. It was like two weeks later and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do anything. The filming was horrible. Everything was horrible. And, um, it was the first time I just couldn't function and I stopped showing up in my business. I stopped showing up. I was too scared. You know, when you, when you know you're under surveillance, but I still didn't know the extent of it and the police were still doing their um, investigation. When you know you're under surveillance, but you don't know who exactly or what exactly, that uncertainty 
leads to such a small existence. And so I stopped marketing. I stopped doing anything. The only people I felt safe with were my students. And thankfully, you know, they were in these membership programs for years. Some of my students have been with me for almost eight years or no, almost seven years. They just stayed with me through the whole thing as I slowly started putting my life I don't want to say back together because it's kind of like where we are right now where a lot of us have been recalibrating and looking at our lives and we're probably not going to go back to the way it was because it wasn't quite right for us. It wasn't, exactly. it wasn't in our best. Mm. Well, just like that t- trauma that's happening to the world, that trauma was happening inside my life and I didn't go back to it. I just started to really get serious about boundaries and really get serious about who I allow around me and what's safe for me. And then little by little, teeny tiny bit by teeny tiny bit, I've started to become a little bit more visible, but it's been scary. Every step is terrifying for me. Yeah. I mean, it sounds, it sounds a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. And I'm, I'm wondering why, I mean, it. You know, as this unfolded and you realized what and, you know, what was happening and, you know, the investigation, I'm wondering if you found out why. Yeah. Why were you of such yeah. scrutiny and vigilance? And, so, um, yeah. I don't know how much you know about narcissism. Mm, quite a bit. I didn't. And people would tell me all the time that he was a narcissist. And I would be mm. like, no, he's not. Like I was so, it was, I was doing the same thing I'd done with my family of origin. I was so insistent on seeing the good because he's my son's father. I don't, I didn't want to ever hate my son's father. Like I couldn't bear mm. to do that to my child. So I just lied to myself. This is, you know, conversations come full circle. Mm. Here we are. Mm. It's yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's back so to that. I, I just lied. So people would say he's a narcissist. I never even took time to look up narcissism. I didn't really know what it was. And here I was a teacher of mm. personal development. I had a huge platform, but I really didn't mm. understand what narcissism was. And it was through that process that I understood, oh, when I broke, when I said that to the therapist, you know, years ago, right, when my son was one, you could feel in the room the injury to him that I had separated from him and had my own opinion because I hadn't before that, right? So we're back to pleasing. So, yeah, that's dangerous, though, isn't it? For a narcissist. Yeah, so you could feel it. That's right. impossible. But I had always let him be on top. So like when we divorced, I gave him yeah. two thirds of our estate, right? I just gave him everything. I didn't even have him give me spousal maintenance when I built most of our fortune, right? I, I was willing to be small little me so that he would just leave me alone and I could just parent my son. But then when I had the audacity to meet a man who became a second father to my son for a narcissist that's really injurious, right? It's threatening his influence and control. And then when I had the audacity to go out in the world and be really successful again, and he was losing what I, you know, what he had gotten in our divorce. When I had the, those were really injurious to him. So that started the first lawsuit, right? And he thought he would win because he always had you know, I think, you know, partially being a white male and also being, you know, a star athlete, his superstar in college and then being, you know, really successful in business. He always won. So he assumed that when he attacked me, he would win. And then when he only not, when he didn't win and then got just hammered, the judge was screaming at him the first time, screaming at him. It just made the injury deeper. And my limited understanding of narcissists is they have to win at all costs. And so he, mm. it, he just had to keep doing it and keep doing it to win. And when he would come and break into my home, I had a court order from state at the court at, at, the, at the curb 
when he would break into my home, it was, he had to find something. It couldn't just be that I was just a great mom and other people respected me. It couldn't just be that because the hallucination, because, you know, all of us have problems with projecting. Anyone who's listening to this, they're going to project their own stuff, right? They'll get triggered from whatever, whatever, whatever. Like we all have problems with that. But narcissists seem to have an extreme relationship with projecting where they build an alternate reality. And he built an alternate reality about me that just wasn't even close to who I was. So he was looking for and digging through my emails and breaking into my home and breaking onto my property to try and support his alternate reality so that he could win, so that he could have control. And the irony of it all is my son went to boarding school finally when he was 16 and he stopped talking to his dad. They don't even have a relationship anymore. Yeah, I was going to ask you where this ends. I mean, yeah, this- no, my son, <sighs> he didn't even tell me. I was, you know, I'd always protected him. So I'd always protected my son and, and never told him what his dad was doing, but he actually involved his dad in the crimes that he committed. So my son had to testify. Isn't, isn't this a, um, it's, it's a diff- difficult subject, this whole idea of how do, we, how do we be with our children when we know things about our, their, maybe their father, for instance, but yeah, we then yeah. protect them and, and, and the, the man that is, we protect the man and don't tell our children the truth, thereby we're actually continuing lies. It's like, it's exactly right. So when my son was about 11 or 12, I started telling him a little bit. Mm. And then he was 13 or 14. I started telling him a little bit more. And then, and, and, and I agree with you. I actually think that I did my son a disservice. So, you know, the last seven years he's, he's doing well now, but I would say the six years before that were probably the hardest. They were the hardest years, hopefully of his lifetime. And it was because I, was lying in the name of being a good mom. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and, I know that listeners will be nodding and like, yep, got it. <laughs> because we, we do, we tell so many lies. To, and, we do. And it's, And if yeah. I can say, because I know we're probably coming to a wrap here, if I could do it again, I would have myself cut ties to his dad, I would have stopped investing in the fantasy that we could co-parent so that I could avoid my own guilt, right? Mm -hmm. I would have stopped avoiding, I would have stopped investing in the fantasy and I would have faced the truth of who he was. And I would have at a younger age asked for, you know, I did all the parenting. So I would have gone to the courts and said, you know, I need to have sole decision making here. I need to be the sole parent for different things. And I didn't until my son was, you know, until his dad forced the issue. And then my son was around 11 or 12. I'm grateful that I even did it at 11 or 12. But if I can say to anyone, if you can find a way to heal the pain that that person has inflicted on you so that you can teach your child how to see the truth and have proper boundaries um, it would probably be a lot smoother. We got there. My son got there. He's incredible. Mm. But it was a rough six years of unwinding what I'd done for 11 or 12 years. Mm. That's a bit of a theme, isn't it? Yeah. I don't talk to moms that often. I know you do this all the time. Is that, it sounds like that's common. Oh, I, I'm, what I mean is the uh, unraveling, having to go back and unravel what we put in place. That's a common thing for us, isn't it? Yeah. We, we, you know, yes. when often yes. we know what we need to do, but we choose not to do it for whatever reason. And again, no blame. Yeah. It's simply that we just, at the time, for one reason or another, we don't face what we need to, and then we have to go back and do it. It's timing, timing, you know, readiness. And maybe we need to go through those next few steps to actually get there. Oh, Christine, this has been wonderful. Um, thank you for inspiring us to, to dig into the whole idea of cutting ties. It's, it's a, a brilliant, brilliant conversation. And mm. thank you for, for walking your talk on this. Thank you. I appreciate you seeing me. It hasn't been easy to unwind 
all of that trauma. It's been really, mm-hmm. it's been a lot, but I'm very, so grateful to be where I am today and to not learn what I've learned. Um, so thank you for giving me an opportunity to share some of that with the women who are listening. I hope it serves. Oh, Kristen, thank you so much for joining me on the show today and for sharing candidly about your experience of cutting ties and so much more. Oh, it's wonderful. Ah, uh, yeah. Listeners, as usual, you'll find the links to connect with Kristen over on schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. Well, next week on the School for Mothers show, I'm going to be joined by my daughter Isadora for an episode called Box. Yes, I said box. This conversation is a bit of a rare one. Now we talk about how Isadora went out shopping for a special box to contain all her pleasure things. As British philosopher Alan Watts said, we get such a kick out of looking forward to pleasures and rushing ahead to meet them that we can't slow down enough to enjoy them when they come. Which is why I'm honoured to share this conversation with you. Her pleasure in buying her pleasure box is what we focus on. I really hope you'll join me. I really do. Well, quick question before I go. Are you a member of the School for Mothers group on Facebook? We've got over a thousand ambitious mothers supporting and cheering us one another on. One of my favourite things about the group are the anonymous questions, where members can share a question completely anonymously. Funnily enough, that's what an anonymous question is. And they receive oodles of advice. A really precious thing about this group, it's a judgment-free space. Basically the polar opposite to a mum's net kind of vibe. And I love mum's net. It's just, well, we just don't need the heavy-handed advice. So you can find us over on Facebook by searching for School for Mothers group or click the link in the show notes. We'd love to see you there in the group. That's it, listeners. Till next week, same time, same place. Meet me here. Thank you for joining us again. Here's to you. Lots of love. Thank you for tuning into the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 